Welcome to the YouTube. Yo, you know, it's like with a topic perspective, man. And man, we're going to continue to give you positive, inspiring stories, man. A testimony and something out there, man, to hopefully help people that are out there, man. Man, but before I do, man, do me a favor. Hit the like button, hit the comments, subscribe. Man, hit that bell notification for your boy, man. Now, I got a, a really, really good testimony I'm about to share with you guys, right? The individual came to, to, to actually the county jail at 16 years old. Facing 282 years, right? He's going to talk about his story being in the county jail at 16 years old, the state that he was facing, the stuff that he's been through in his life, and then we're going to stop when he's 18, right? But in the future, you're going to hear about when they found him back when he was 19 on a murder beat case that he ended up beating, his struggles when he went to prison, and his struggles with addiction when he got to the streets. He just barely turned 21 years old. He has a six month, a beautiful six month year old daughter. And he's trying to change his weight, man. He got the testimony for you guys, man. So without further ado, I'm gonna let him introduce himself. Yo, 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 it's magic. I'm from I just wanna introduce myself, but before I get into introducing myself or saying where I'm from or anything like that, I want to make it clear, very clear, that I I'm not trying to glorify the life that I've had or anything that had to do with it growing up, yeah, it was fun and all, but, man, let me tell you, it was not, it's not nothing nice, you know, it gets real in the streets, for real, but, anyways, um, introduce myself, my name is Magic, I'm from, I'm from Southside Tucson, I grew up on a road called Bilby Street, I don't know if anyone's heard of it or not, that's besides the fact, I just want to get a little into my life, you know, I hope that, Maybe this this can this can reach somebody, you know what I mean? Whether it's a kid, whether it's a teenager, you know, someone my age, you know, uh, a parent or what or whatnot, you know. I, I just really hope it could touch someone's heart and see that this is this is not the way to grow up. If you can if you can choose otherwise, you know, whether you find Jesus or whatever your higher power is, you know, like it's it's not it's it's not nice out here in the streets, you know. Anyways. Well, good so I, I'll start off when, around when I was like 10, 11 years old. You know, everything was good. Everything was cool, you know. I, it was a lot, don't get me wrong, there was a lot of stuff going on. There was a lot of wrong going on around me, but I didn't know none of that. I was oblivious to all that because of the fact that I was so young and all that stuff was normal to me in my life. There was a whole lot going on, you know. And, well, everything was all good until... You know, I started realizing that my mama wasn't there. You know what I mean? We we didn't have no parents. It was me, it was me and two other younger siblings. And well, like time passes, time passes, and one day my baby sister she comes crying to me and she's telling me she's hungry. You know what I mean? And you know, I realized I'm hungry too. You know, it was the worst thing ever. You know, I'm at I'm like 11, 12 years old. You know what I'm saying? And that that was rough. That was rough to it was. It made me sad. It broke my heart because my mom was in the room. Their daddy's in the room too. My stepdad, you know, that, you know, when you're stuck in that room, you know what I mean? I'm pretty sure a lot of us know what that means, you know what I mean? When our parents are just stuck in that room. But, man, let me tell you, my mama would get food stamps, $1,200 of food stamps for every one of her kids that she couldn't raise. Let me put that out there. And she wouldn't spend a single dollar of it on, on food, you know what I'm saying? So, your boy, your boy Magic had to get up and how to do something about it, you know what I mean? And me going out into going out into the real world, you know, it it's tough. You know, I had to do things. I had to do certain things for money that not a regular person at 11, 12 years old should be doing. You know what I mean? Like at all, not one bit. And, you know, I got I got into the gang life. I got into the gang life. I got into the, the hustling life. You know what I mean? We're we're selling stuff that we probably shouldn't be selling. You know what I mean? It's, I had to do what I had to do for my for my family, you know what I mean? My baby sister, my baby brother was hungry, you know what I mean? I came home every day with food and they was happy, you know what I mean? So it was like if I was if it was like if I was raising them too, you know what I mean? But at the same time I'm being raised by the streets. You know what I mean? And well, let me fast forward a little. Um one day, um uh, I was at home, you know, I left the house, I left the house with everything I had, you know, and I ended up um 
somebody basically robbed me for everything that I had, you know what I mean? And that, that was the day that my whole mindset on hustling and working for what I got, whatever, changed, you know what I mean? I started, I, I, that built up a lot of anger in me because they took everything that I had to feed my family, you know? And, well, that's where I got into a life of, you know, I'm, I'm, I got arsenals in my closet, you know what I mean? I, I'm, I was known, I was known for gunning. I was known started that's when I started robbing that's when I started doing all types of stuff that I should not have been doing you know what I mean and well that's really when I earned my name magic because well I don't you know things disappeared you know stuff happens anyways let me fast forward a little more into my life so I was grew up I grew up going in, in and out of juvenile you know what I mean um my, my mama, uh, she couldn't, she couldn't handle the, she couldn't handle the job of being a parent. When I first went into juvenile, my baby sister, and my baby brother got taken away from CPS. Luckily, thank God that that happened because if that wouldn't have happened, I don't know how they would have ate. I don't know how they would have gotten taken care of. They got adopted, you know, they, they have a family now. They're living good. Well, anyways, so... I was out. I was out in the streets. I was 16 years old. This is where it gets real. This is where stuff gets real. I mean, I I hit the streets and I don't know. I had just got out from doing a year and two months of juvenile time. I got out and yeah, I went. Right. I had a job in my life. I don't know how to work, so I got right back to doing what I knew how to do. I got I got to filling food back. I got to robbing food, you know. Um, but that wasn't nothing good because at the end of the day I was messing my life up you know what I mean I was messing my life up I was there was people I was robbing that they they had problems with me I started problems with some with a whole other gang here in Tucson they started a little war on the south side here you know what I mean like it was it, it got hectic it got real hectic in the streets I, I got I was out for about two and a half months, bro. But let me tell you, these were like the funniest two and a half months of my life at this point. You know what I mean? Me and a certain friend caught for a lot of this stuff we done. Me, bro, me and me and bro, we touched ninety thousand dollars in in a time frame of two months, bro. Like a sixteen-year-old with fifty racks, man. I was turned up, bro. You know what I'm saying? But one one of these days, um, one day it all changed. You know, I was um, I left the trap. I had I had U.S. Marshals looking for me. I had U.S. Marshals raiding cribs in Phoenix, raiding cribs in Tucson looking for me. It was every every officer in TPD had a picture of me on their dashboard looking for me. You know what I mean? Like that's not man. I I couldn't even I couldn't walk down the street. I couldn't leave the crib without getting getting trying to get apprehended. Well, one day. I got caught, you know, it's not, like, I got caught, and, well, I got caught, when I was arrested, I thought I was good, you know, I thought I was good, they, they arrested me originally on five charges, it was, uh, an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, an armed robbery, possession of narcotics, some paraphernalia, and another, uh, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, so I thought, I'm good, you know, I'll be out within a couple of years, whatever, you know, I'll be all right, whatever, I hit the county, they charged me as an adult, mind you, they tried me as an adult at 16 years old, and I go, you know, three I spend like three, four, five days in county, and then I'm going to my indictment hearing, you know? I'm not really tripping or nothing. And when I sit down and see the indictments, let me say the indictment, plural, there's four indictments sitting in front of me. The first one in front of me says attempted murder. The next two say aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The, man, and an armed robbery case with six armed robberies on it. Well, let me tell you, it added up to like 47 felonies in total with four separate cases. Man, that shit was nothing nice, bro. Nothing nice. I was scared in that moment. I was, man, I'm 16. I already messed up my whole life. I'm never coming home. A month later, I go to court and, you know, they got so much evidence on me that, man, it was, it was not, it was not funny. It was not even nothing to joke about. And I'm not, when I was out, I thought it was all fun. I thought it was all fun and games. And at this moment, they, they're telling me, I cannot plead. I cannot plead, I, don't, I can't have a plea, they're forcing me to trial, you know, at trial, I know that I'll be guilty and lose because I'm on camera for a lot of this stuff, bro. You know, they had me for three shootings and six-five robberies was the main thing they were trying to get me for, and 
man, 55 to 282 years is a lot of time to look at at 16. You know, I'm. They wouldn't have gave me 55. They would not have given me 55 years. Man, if they would have gave me 150 years, I would have been lucky. Man, I'll be out by the time I'm 290. You know what I mean? Like, man, it was. It's crazy, but let me tell you, when I was when I was out there, I thought. I didn't think about none of this. I wasn't thinking none of this. All I've ever wanted in my life was a family, and I couldn't find that. I couldn't get that from nobody. I couldn't get that from nothing. I thought I had a family when I was out there with these people. We're jacking people. We're we're doing all types of stuff, man. But the moment I get arrested, let me tell you, everything that I had out there, from product to clothes to money, man, the moment I get locked up, all that goes out the window. All that goes out the window because they won't even drop a hundred dollar check on my book. Not a single, not a single dollar went to my books. But you know it's all right because they can have all that. Let me tell you a little, a little more about life in the juvenile. Man, you know you're looking at a lot of times, so you really don't care. You don't care. You don't have a single care in the world. Not one. You know I'm, I'm in here, and there's this, there's a CEO. We're gonna say her name is Fergus because I'm not gonna say her exact name. She was mean. She was a B word. She was real mean, real mean, bro. Like she made my life hell. She made my life hell, and you know that only made things harder. That only made things real harder in here. Like, it, bro, you do, you do you do the most to make them do paperwork, make them do their job. You know what I mean? Because they ain't doing nothing. They sitting down lazy. So let me make you let me make your life a little harder. You know, and that only made my life harder as well, you know. You know, you don't think of these things when you're a kid, you know, but, man, I was going through a lot in that juvenile pod, bro. Like, there was, there was people, we, we got to scrap every day in there. And there you really got, let me tell you, the juvenile side is a lot. Outside, you know what I mean? Them little, them little kids don't got no respect for nothing, no one, or themselves. But you had to prove yourself. You really had to prove yourself because, and there, there's no politics. There's no rules. There's no structure. So we're dumping every day. My first telly I had, man, we were in the cell for about two days before they moved me out because I was, I got the whooping on dude. Anyways, well, so, but let me tell you something about the CEOs in that pod. The CEOs especially don't have no respect because they talk, They walk around talking to these kids, to all these other juveniles, however the heck they want. Mind you, all these other juveniles, for the most part, have had a lot of things handed to them. You know what I'm saying? And, man, well, these CEOs walk around calling everyone punks, pussies, and bitches, you know? And if anyone's been locked up before, you know, those are three words you don't call nobody unless you, you're ready to get got. So, I'm going to talk about a particular story. There was a CEO. Last night with an R, we just won't say that. Um, Mr. R, you know, he's walking by my cell and he's, he's passing me the food and he almost dropped it on the floor, you know, and, and I say something like, hey man, like you gotta be careful, like, you know, you almost dropped my food, I know you wouldn't give me another trick. And he told me, he told me to, he told me to be quiet and I'm a little bitch and I won't do nothing anyway, you know what I mean? So I was like, hey, man, let me tell you, you could talk to all the rest of these other kids around here however the heck you want, but me, I'm not the one, you know, I'm not the one, I'm not the one to talk to like that. I was raised differently. I was brought up really differently, bro. And right now, I really could care less about none of this. You know, I'm getting life for all I care, you know what I mean? And whatever, dude laughs and he, he said whatever, punk, you know what I mean? And he, this is the biggest mistake. He, the biggest mistake that CEO made of his job was letting everybody out for day room after that. He didn't lock me down. He didn't take my day room, nothing. He let me out. He let me out for day room, man. Well, we're sitting, you know, and the whole time I'm plotting. I'm plotting. He has no idea, and I'm just mugging, dude. I'm plotting. I, I know that I want to get this CEO. This is a CEO. This is an officer that works here. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm barely about to turn 17. You know what I'm saying? I still got... I still got time in me, you know, and, bro, well, they had a, they had a refrigerator in the back of the CO desk, and he's in the refrigerator, he's in the freezer looking for who knows what, but, man, let me tell you, the moment he shut that freezer door, I was right there to, I was right there to crack him, I got the stick, you know, 
Man, let me tell you, I've never gotten so much. I've never beat someone up so bad before. Never. And this was a CO, you know, someone that's trained to fight and slam and do all types of nonsense, you know what I mean? And I, I need dude in the face. Bro, I, I got... It was so bad that he couldn't even hit the button on his radio to get help. It's like, the, I had all the juveniles in the pod talk, yeah, get that food, man, get them, you know what I mean? It was, man, I was hyped up. I was hyped up, bro. I was, bro, I was, I was getting on, dude. I had them marked up. I, well, eventually, the tag team comes in, and the tag team is like, it's basically a, it's a group of SEALs that, you know, they, for anyone that's not cooperating at whatsoever, they get, they get sent in, and they, Man, they fuck people up, let me tell you. Excuse, excuse my language, but man, they fuck people up. And when well, they came in finally, Bradley, they snatched me up. They they took me to a cell, and man, when they when I got to that cell, it was not nothing nice. Let me tell you, the way he looked, whew, let me tell you, my my face was way worse. My face was way worse. These these COs, I guess they're allowed to uh, stomp people out and. Fuck who doesn't what how you know don't matter how old they is because they're charged as adults right you know so they they can do people in bad but man that was like one of the worst ass beatings I've ever gotten in my life it was six COs beating on me but the the craziest part about all of this is like a week or so later this CO comes back the CO that uh, I had ran up on behind the CO desk like this all happened behind the CO desk it was. It's, it's 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 unheard of. It's never been done before. You know, I was like a legend in that pod forever. <laughs> Anyways, um, well, that CEO comes back to work, and he still he still had some lumps on his face or whatever. And he came to my door, and he opened the door, and I thought we were about to fight again. You know, I'm not gonna lie, I got up, I was ready, and he got to telling me he respects me, and that he'll never speak to me that way again, and like he, he basically gave me he gave me his respect. You know. And like even COs were talking about this for like the longest time. I'm telling you, when I say I was a legend, I was like a legend in that part. I swear to God. Well, well, it wasn't nothing good though neither because that that really made me uh, go crazy after that because they have this thing called cuff status. You you come out of your cell. You're you're in a cell by yourself and you have to come behind your back. You got you got shackles on. Sometimes a belly chain, depending on the COs. You know what I mean. And man, it's not it's not cool. And given that you're on status and they have to give everyone else time to come out, you come out like once, twice, three times a week. Those are time where I didn't come out for a month and a half. Man, that's that shit was all bad. And there was um during that time where I'm on cuff status, I um like two weeks, like maybe a month after that. I called one of my family members in, and this is where I got um, information that, well, I found out that my cousin got killed. This was my bro, bro. This was my dog, you know, and they shot him in the head with an AR. You know, it was, that was like one of the worst things that I could hear because during this whole other time, I keep hearing every other month that someone's dying, one of my homies is dying, one of my homies is dying, but when I found out that my cousin died, man, that was all bad. Like, that was, like, the only family member I had ever been close to. And he was in the streets, too, with me, you know? So that's probably why we was close, but, man, it was all bad. But let me tell you, it gets worse. Let me tell you, it gets worse. A couple weeks passed by, you know, I'm going crazy. I'm drawing pictures of my cousin on the wall, you know? I'm, I'm doing all types of stuff, and, well, one day, um, some some new some new kid comes in. He They, they locked him up for a murder. And he happens to be the uh, the person who who allegedly killed my cousin, you know? Man, that that was hard. That was real hard. I have to watch I have to watch this guy. I have to watch this guy I have to watch this guy be happy every day, you know, and but from that moment on I knew what I wanted to do to do that dude, you know what I mean? I knew what I wanted to do to that guy. And well, I plotted these whole next few months. I plotted, I plotted, I plotted, I plotted, and you know, I, I made a couple bangers. I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but it should be common sense. You know what I mean? I made a couple bangers, and well, they had taken me off cuff status, and 
I had a Sally. I had a Sally, and me and him were real cool. And he kind of, I kind of let him know what it was because these CEOs were going to move that dude that killed my cousin. No, oh, you know what I mean? It, they had no idea that I would have any relations to the person he killed, nothing like that. They had no clue. And they were going to move him into my cell because of overflow. Well, you know, I was ready. I was ready for him to come into that cell. Man, I was ready to... Bro, let me, I was going to do something that would have completely messed everything up. Worse, even worse, you know? It would have given me 350 years, you know what I'm saying? Who knows? But they were going to, when, the moment they were about to put him in, he was sitting outside of my door, he he told the CEOs that uh, he didn't feel safe going in my cell. Yeah, straight pussy. Anyways, he told the CEOs that he didn't want to come into my cell because he, he knew that I would hurt him or something like that. And, you know, the CEOs took me out of my cell, they took my celly out, and they searched my whole cell, and they found, they found a couple of shanks in my mattress, you know what I mean? Not one, but two. Two. And I got charged for that. I got charged for that. Mind you, I had just gotten off cuff status. I was off cuff status for about two weeks. Man, right back on cuff status, you know what I'm saying? And that's where um, I, turned seven, I turned 17 on cuff status, but... It was even worse for me in my head because I'm like, damn, that was my only opportunity to do anything for my cousin. And, you know, I couldn't even get it done. You know what I mean? If they wouldn't have found nothing in my cell, there would have been other ways to do something. But let me tell you, that kind of saved me. That kind of saved me because I would have did something that I would have regretted for the rest of my life. But, well, I'm 17, you know, I'm 17, I'm on cuff status now, I'm for sure by myself, like, I'm, I'm right there alone, like, I'm alone, and I'm, I'm going through so much, and there was this other CEO, another female CEO, you know, she ended up work. they ended up moving her to, to the pod, and, you know, she was real nice to me, she was real nice, you know, and I, me being the crazy, the crazy, young-minded person that I was, you know, I, you know, I try to holler, you know, I try to, you know, I spit my little game, you know what I'm saying, I, I, you know, I eventually I got in there, you know what I'm saying? I got in there, this CEO, I had this CEO, man, I had this CEO telling me she loved me every day before she left work. I, man, it was, it was cool, you know, so she really helped, she really helped me out the rest of my time. She was cool, she was, she was, she was nice, you know what I mean? She was nice to me. Not every CEO's nice, every CEO's me, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> every CEO's me, so hey, I took advantage of that, you know, I took advantage of that, man. Man, my son, he's like, he's laughing right now. <laughs> he's like, yeah, but I, I had to take advantage of that. You know, I, it was it was the only thing positive in my life at the moment. And, you know, she would bring me, she'd bring me food from the street. You know what I'm saying? And that was about it. You know what I'm saying? I was, it was nothing, nothing crazy. Oh, yeah. So let me tell you why. Let me tell you why my life went to hell again. <laughs> so they ended up putting, she was working overtime one day. And they had her in the female pod, in the crazy pod. It's where the crazy females are, man. These females are nuts. They're insane. But females started disrespecting her, and she started saying all types of crazy stuff to her. And she, she cuffed the, man, she cuffed this female up to the bed. And she couldn't, she had her there all day. She left her there all day. She, when she left her shift, she left her there cuffed up. She ended up getting fired for that, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, that's when I... That's when I lost contact with her, you know what I mean? Because I, well, I couldn't just get out in a couple months like everyone else did and, you know, hit her up or nothing like that. You know, I was I was ready to go to the penitentiary. So, yeah, I was ready to go to the fiend, though, man, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it was, anyways, months go by, a few months go by, you know, and eventually, well, I had, Mind you, I didn't mention that all this time that I'm when I was on the streets and I was and I was and I had all that money, you know, some of that money I was putting away at this other female's house and this female helped me get a lawyer when I when I got locked up. And, you know, I didn't have no hope either still, you know, because they were trying to force me to trial and I thought that the lawyer was a waste of money. But one day it gave me a little bit of hope. It gave me a little bit of hope when they came and um, they brought me a plea. My first plea deal was six to 25 years with probation afterwards. And you know, I was like, man, that sounded way better than 55 to 282 years, man. I promise you it did, but I had court the next day, so I had 
a decision to make within 24 hours whether I wanted to sign that or try to fight for something better or or just wait, you know, and think about it. And well, when I was in that courtroom the next day, and um, they put the plea in front of me for me to sign, I was like, man, you're on here, like I. I need some time to think about this. I barely saw this for the first time yesterday. I haven't had the time to go over it with my lawyer. And, you know, the state prosecutor, man, they don't like to hear none of that. So they got up. They, You know, for us to get a plea, it's up to the state. So they got up and they got to saying, well, he was, he was expected to sign this by today. And, well, they, if he's not ready to sign today, then the state's going to pull the plea. And that was my one and only chance to sign that plea in that the plea away from me. So the little hope that I did have from getting a plea, well, it went out the window that moment. And, you know, so I had to go to court the next day, I mean, the next week, and they had to reassign me a new trial date. Another year in county that I had to wait. Mind you, I was already in here for about 16 months. Man, I'm like, wow, I gotta wait another year to find out if I'm gonna get 100 years or not, you know, and I knew that I was as guilty as far as, you know what I mean? And this was like, it was it was messed up because in my head I would have signed that if I would like if I would have knew that they were gonna take it from me at that moment that moment I knew I was gonna sign. Well, one day, one day my my lawyer my lawyer came and told me he, that he might he might have something that could help me. And it was a case law. I don't remember the exact case law, but it basically stated that anyone that catches a case under the age of 18, whether they are charged in the door or not. They cannot get an aggravated sentence, so therefore they could not force me to trial. They could not force me to go to trial, and they had to shoot me a plea. They had to give me a plea that was unaggravated. So, long story short, I ended up getting a plea. I had gotten my three shootings dismissed under because of the circumstances that they all happened, and I had to sign for three on robberies, and then my other three on robberies would go out the window, and all the little other add-ons they were already irrelevant. So I thought, you know, I, they, they stand three to five years. I'm like, wow, you know, that's, that's got to be God. That's got to be God, you know. And he's real, you know. And, I, you know, I signed that plea quick. I signed that plea quick. Three to five years. I, I was at the time, I was 17. I was about to turn 18 a month later. They sent my, they sent my uh, sentencing date for a month after. And I had turned 18. I had turned 18 years old. I turned 18 years old, and a week after, we'll say like eight days after I got sentenced, you know, I was hoping for that four years. You know, they, you know, they maxed your boy out at five. They gave me five years, and this is where they got me. This is where they really got me because they had to give me probation for one, for the, for the other stuff. They gave me five years of prison and five years of probation after my prison time's over. And you know, I'll get a little more into detail about all that afterwards. But let me tell you, that's where they got me. Also. Oh yeah, hey, right before I turned 18, you know, they can't have a juvenile in, in a pond with other adults if they're if they're under age. So they held me here until 12.01 a.m. on my birthday. 12.01, that moment, they let me in the pod, you know what I mean? You know, I would have sued them for this, you know what I mean? <laughs> but they, I was waiting for them to put me in a little early, but they didn't. So let me, I'm gonna wrap it up a little bit, you know, there should be another, there should be a part two coming soon, you know what I'm saying? Uh, i like to thank everyone for hearing, hearing this out, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to my boy Flaco, who, who made this all happen. You know, yeah, Mr. Burpee King over here, he's doing 1,400 burpees every day at 5 in the morning, I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> yeah, beast mode. But, you know, I'm gonna pass it back out to my boy Flaco. Thank you. All right, guys, without further ado, we're going to have part two. I hope you guys enjoyed this, man. But like, I hope, like, like all of us, man, it's a positive message to every team, man. Like, hope you guys can learn something from this, man. We don't want anybody to make the same choices, decisions that we're making, man. And this going to be, part two is going to be interesting, man. Like, his life changed. He gets out. He has a baby. And where he's at today, man, Um, you know, he's uh he's walking the same walk I'm trying to walk right now. So without, uh, without further ado, you guys have a good one.